If you don't know who I am, I'm Joe Aronson. I am the community life pastor here at Community Church. Uh, it is Pastor David's birthday today, and so naturally he is at brunch where he should be with his family. Um, so make sure you send him some love, a text message or a Facebook message or whatever, uh, just wishing him a happy birthday. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can start to turn to Philippians chapter 2 as we continue in this series. But before we do that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to gather together. And Lord, as we think, about, we think about your church and we think about being a part of your church, your, your local church here at, at Community, but we think about even within, the, within our state and we, we start to think about how, how big this really is, that there are churches all around the world that are gathering this morning to honor you and to worship you. And God, we, we start to think about the time that since the, the, the church was, was founded 2,000-ish years ago with, with Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, which we, we celebrate this morning, we celebrate that birthday this morning as well. We, it can be a little overwhelming, and we can start to feel very, very small very quickly as we think about the number of people who have followed you and put their faith and trust in you and and God we it just makes us even more grateful for you and how big you are that you know us intimately you know the hairs that are on our head or the lack thereof Lord that you you don't just know us impersonally but you know us personally God would you continue to grow your church as you promised that you would do, would you finish the work that you have started in us? God, as even now as we engage with your word, would you help to, to continue that work that you have started in us, helping to transform us into the image of Jesus? Jesus, would you be big this morning? It's, just, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I was standing in the woods... Uh, in a, on a late August day, it was about 72 degrees, like 48% humidity and zero bugs. It was gorgeous. I'm standing there in these woods in, in Winniconne, which is like 20 minutes that way. And I'm standing there in front of this group of about 150 people-ish. And they're they're kind of organized into two separate groups. There's one over here and there's one over here and there's this big gap in between their chairs right down the, right down the middle. And I'm standing there and all these people are looking at me and then suddenly they, they stand up as this woman starts to walk down the aisle with her dad. And she looked gorgeous. And we wa she walked up and then I shook Herb's hand, and we <clears throat> turned around, and we faced this other guy. His name is Carl Kramer, and, and we, we said some things. And he said some things. He said a lot of things because he's a preacher, and that's what they do. We made some promises, and bada-bing, bada-boom, I got some new hardware on my finger, and we were married, and it was a really great day. It was absolutely gorgeous, and, and Anna and I are still married, praise the Lord, and we have three children, and Lord willing, we'll continue to be married. Isn't it interesting how when we talk about like getting married, we talk about getting married almost like it's a one-time event, not that like you get married multiple times, because it's not the way it's supposed to go, but we get married and we, we talk about it almost like it's a, it's a one-time event, because I, I was married, I got married at a particular time, but, but I still continue to be married after that time. I, I was married. There was a time when, when I was not married, and then Anna walked up the aisle, we stood in front of Carl, and then he pronounced us husband and wife, and something new happened. There was a change that occurred, and we walked down the aisle as, as husband and wife. But being married was not contained to just that one event. I was married, I am married, and I will be married. And I made a lot of promises on August 28, 2010, and I spend the rest of my days living up to or trying to live up to those promises that I made to Anna and to the Lord. Being married is not 
a single event. Getting married is not a single event. It's something that takes you through the rest of your time together on earth or until the Lord returns, living up to what is already true. And that's the same, when we talk about salvation, it can often come across that same way too. We talk about salvation like it's a one-time incident. There was a time that I met Jesus where he, he changed my life, where, where he came and he made me clean and he made me pure and he made me holy. And while that is absolutely true, there is a time if you were a follower of Jesus that you moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You were an object of wrath and now you are no longer that. Even if you were five with your parents in your bedroom kneeling at your bed and you prayed to receive Jesus, that happened. We know that because the scriptures tell us that. But just because you were saved doesn't mean that salvation is contained within that moment. You were saved, you are being saved, and you will continue to be saved. You, when you move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, God says a lot of things about you. He says that you are pure and holy and blameless and you are his child and you spend the rest of your days living up to what he says about you, growing in your understanding of who it is that you are, living up to that new person, that new creation that he says that you are. Because God has created you to be a living example of who he is, a walking, talking, breathing statue of what he loves and what he is all about. We are supposed to shine like stars in the night sky, to use this passage from Philippians. We're called to be different from the world around us. So let's look at this passage. This is in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. All things, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that on the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even though I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith." I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. This passage starts with a really important word that says, therefore, which means we need to pay attention to the things that were said before. So if you weren't here last week when Pastor David covered the first part of chapter two, check out the video podcast or listen to it on your way to work. Uh, As long as you're not distracted driving, we are down with that type of thing. Therefore... Because all of these things are true, you need to do these things. This is a, there's a transition that happens. He's, he, Paul goes from talking about Jesus and who he is, and though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, and then God ex- highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name that at every knee will bow and tongue confess on heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is who Jesus is. This is why we follow him together. This is the God that we worship, the God who comes and dwells among us. And then Paul continues and says, therefore, because all of those things are true, because Jesus is humble, because Jesus is a servant, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if you've been around church for a while, you know that there's this big conversation about faith and works and how we don't earn our way into God's favor. And so when people read this verse, they say, wait a minute, we're not supposed to work our salvation. God has given us grace. He has saved us by grace through faith so that nobody can boast. What in the world is he talking about here? He's talking about salvation like I talked about marriage before. It's not just a one-time event, but is a continual process. So when he gets down to it, he says, if you are a follower of Jesus, act like it. If you are a follower of Jesus, 
prove it. Put your proverbial money where your mouth is. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Another way to say that would be walk in your salvation. If you are a follower of Jesus, you need to act like it. You're not working for your salvation. You're working out your salvation. This is not talking about earning your way into God's favor. It's not about earning our way into heaven. Because this, this word works, it can be really complicated and it can mean different things in different contexts. So you are saved by grace through faith, not of your own doing, not of your own works, so that no one can boast. He's talking about merit. When he talks about you're not saved by the things that you do, he's not talking about works, even though that's the way it's translated. He's talking about merit. He's talking about standing on the things that you have done and said, I am good enough. I have done the things that are required, and I should be allowed to. I have earned this status as a child of God. That's not the way that God works. But God is not against work. In fact, the scriptures say that God has prepared good works for us to do in advance. There's a lot of things that we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to conduct ourselves. We're supposed to work in a specific way as followers of Jesus. The Bible is not against works. God is not against works, but it is against merit. And those are very different things. So we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're supposed to walk in our salvation. We're supposed to live up to the things that God has said about us when he saved us, made us pure and righteous and holy. And then he continues on. He says, this is how you do that. You do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The NIV translate that, translates that last phrase as shine like stars in the sky. What's so interesting about the first part of this in, in verse 14 where it says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. It's really interesting. When you go back to the original Greek, it says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. It's really incredible how accurate our translations are. Do all things without grumbling or disputing or quarreling, Paul says, from prison. So, What does this passage mean, you guys? You guys, what does this passage mean? It means do all things without grumbling or quarreling. This is really easy, at least easy to understand. So let's just think about this for a minute. What would fit into the category of all things? Let's start with the other one. What would fit into the category of not all things? It's a rhetorical question, obviously. He's literally talking about everything. In everything that you do, in all the things that you do, wherever you go, whatever you do, do all things without grumbling or quarreling. This is a really easy passage to understand at the surface level and really gets to the point of it. But he does something really interesting that's at a little bit of a deeper level. See, he's pulling from this grumbling or disputing. Paul doesn't just make that up. He doesn't make up this idea of a crooked and twisted generation. And he doesn't even make up the part about shining like stars in the night sky. In fact, he's pulling these ideas from the Old Testament. He pulls the the idea of grumbling and quarreling from the books of Exodus, chapter 16 and chapter 17. So let me catch you up to speed here real quick. People of Israel are in slavery in Egypt, and then God comes and he sends this guy named Moses, let my people go. He says to the king of that particular part of the world, that king says no, his name is Pharaoh, and then these plagues come, and there's all sorts of craziness that happens, and then Pharaoh finally says, yep, take him and leave, get out of here. And so 
the entire nation of Israel leaves and they, they leave and God has rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. The Red Sea has been parted and as they were walking through it, they've got to the other side. The, uh, the army of Pharaoh is coming right closely behind them and then the waters crash over them and that army is never to be seen again. <clears throat> now, that's where we pick up on this story. As Israel is walking towards Mount Sinai, where they're going to have this define the relationship conversation with God, where God is going to give them the Ten Commandments and those sorts of things. But they've got some ways they've got to go before they actually get there. And they're traveling through the desert, okay? They're traveling through the desert. And in Exodus chapter 16, they start to grumble. They start to grumble and say things like, Remember when we were back in Egypt and things were so good? I mean, yeah, we were slaves, but at least we had food. God led us out into the desert. He saves us, saved us by the hands of the Egyptians, and now we're going to die of starvation. Thank you very much, God. We really appreciate it. And they grumble and complain because they don't have food and their stomachs are hungry. The next chapter, they start to do the same thing about water because they're in the desert and there's not a ton of water. And so they're like, God, you led us out of slavery in Egypt to come and to die of thirst. And so then they actually come at Moses and they quarrel with Moses. Like, why are you doing this? As he's speaking on behalf of God, which is where the complaining part comes into play. It comes into play. So these two ideas of grumbling and quarreling or complaining, they kind of become symbolic of the people of Israel. They've just experienced all of these incredible things that God has done on their behalf, and now they are grumbling and quarreling, okay? That's the first thing that Paul pulls from. Second thing, he pulls from the book of Deuteronomy. So, after the nation of Israel has gotten to the foot of Mount Sinai, God gives them the Ten Commandments, and they're walking around, and they're about to go into the Promised Land, and then they disobey what God tells them to do, so they don't get to go into the Promised Land. Moses doesn't get to go either, and so they wander around the desert for 40 years. And then they finally are able to come into the Promised Land, and as they're standing at the edge of the Promised Land, Moses gives them the book of Deuteronomy which is basically a rehashing of the law that God had originally given them. And at the very end of the book, he sings this song over them. Moses sings this song talking about what has happened uh, in and through them, the experiences that they have had. And he's talking about God, and he's talking about the faithfulness of God, and that he hasn't, he hasn't given up on his promises. And then he calls the nation of Israel a crooked and twisted generation. Because they have disobeyed God and turned their back on him. And so Paul pulls from that portion here. And then he goes to the book of Daniel. The end of the book of Daniel, chapter 12. And this is a type of literature called apocalyptic literature. It's really complicated. It's kind of like if you had never seen a comic book before. And then you suddenly have this comic book and you're supposed to read it, but you don't have any context for what it's talking about. It's not going to make any sense, okay? Apocalyptic literature uh, is around for a couple hundred years on either side of when Jesus is born, and then it functionally disappears. So we don't really have a context for this type of literature, so it's really difficult for us to understand. So you can go and you can read it on your own time. This is Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let me just give you the post-digested version of it, okay? And this is what he says. He's talking about when Jesus will return and make all things new. When this prophet comes and he makes all things new and he will resurrect his people and they will inherit everlasting life and they will shine like stars in the night sky. So what Paul is weaving together as he pulls these different things, it's very easy. Don't grumble, don't complain, don't quarrel. Really easy. That's how you're supposed to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But what Paul is weaving together on a deeper level is that the Jews were God's children. The people of Israel were God's children, but they grumbled and complained instead of being filled with gratitude for what, had, what God had done on their behalf, i.e. the plagues and rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt. And what he's saying is don't be like them. Don't be like them. We get another chance to redo this story. God has saved us from slavery to sin, and because of Jesus, we get a redo 
We can be children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, the grumbling Israelites. And as we do this, we will shine like stars in the sky, or as the ESV says, we will shine like lights in the world. Shine like stars in the sky. About 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Morocco. And uh, there was one part of this trip, we were there for like two weeks, and we, um, we got to camp in the Sahara Desert. It was awesome. We rode camels out to this campsite, and it was a whole thing. And there's, the only thing that's in, really in the Sahara Desert were these giant sand dunes, and they shift because of the wind and stuff. But there were these random cats. Like, I don't know where they were living or what they were doing, but there were these cats everywhere. It was very mind-boggling. Anyway, so we're in the Sahara Desert, and we're camping, and as the sun is going down, we start to see these stars appear in the sky. And... There's nothing to block your view. There's not trees or anything like that. There's nothing to block, obstruct your view of these skies, and there's no light pollution either. There's not another light for miles and miles around. We rode camels to come into this particular spot. And it was one of the most beautiful things that I have ever seen. It's just this, this canvas of black and speckled with these bright, bright stars. And that type of thing would have, that, that's what Paul is getting at here as he pulls from the book of Daniel. He's talking about them shining like stars in the sky. Now, the next day I got food poisoning and had to throw up in a Turkish toilet. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it later, but whatever. That part was not great. The camping in the Sahara Desert was really, really great. And that's what we're supposed to be. He pulls this image and he says, this is how you are supposed to be. You are supposed to shine like stars against a black night sky. God's people are supposed to shine like stars. As followers of Jesus, God gives us this expectation to be different from the world around us, to work out our salvation, to walk in our salvation, to actually act like we're saved. What a novel idea. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. When he's talking about salvation, remember, he's not talking about a one-time event. He's talking about a continual process, just like marriage. Think about this. So if I would have gotten married to Anna, and then like two weeks later, I would have gone on a date with somebody else. Does that make me a good guy or a bad guy? Bad guy, bad guy, bad guy. That makes me a bad guy. This is easy. I'd be a total jerk, a total jerk. And so in that same line of thinking, that same analogy, what Paul is really telling us is don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Act like you're married. Act like you're saved. Do what God calls you to do. Learn about what God wants you to value and then value those things. Learn about what God loves and then love those things. Learn about the things that God hates and then hate those things. Grow in your own holiness and purity. Work for the welfare of the widow and the orphan. Work out your salvation. And so how are we supposed to do that? Paul, how are we supposed to do that? That's a really great idea, but I functionally have no idea what that means. And then he gives us a really, really easy thing to do to work out our salvation. He says, don't grumble or complain. Super simple, but really difficult. (laughs) Because grumbling is so easy to do. We can always find something to whine about, can't we? Work, or family, or friends, or the fact that Xbox Live is down and you just want to play PUBG with your buddies. Like, we've got lots of things that we can whine about. Just all of the things. If you think about any area of your life, you can find something to whine about. It's just so much work, and we even use this phrase, the struggle is real. (laughs) Ironically, right? 
And in, the great irony is that most of the time, the things that we whine about were once the things that we wished for. The things that we whine about are once, were once the things that we were wishing for. I do a lot of premarital counseling. It's actually one of my favorite, the favorite parts of my job. Um, so I sit down with these couples, and they're like totally love struck. And like, oh my goodness, this person is just like literally the best. I can't think of anything that I don't like about them. They, it's that whole like you complete me idea, which I have a very fun time totally picking apart and dissecting. Maybe that makes me a psychopath, but whatever. I really enjoy it. And I think it's beneficial for them too. So it's all good. But they come into my office and we sit down and they're just like, oh, you're the best. And then I talk to them six months later and they're like, oh, this person, like, I say one thing, like, Put the dishes in the dishwasher. Don't put them by the sink. Put them in the dishwasher. And he does this thing, like he comes home from work, and he kicks off his shoes, and then he goes and sits on the couch. And then he has the audacity to just leave his socks in the middle of the living room floor like some sort of caveman. What is the matter with this person? Literally, I can't even right now. Like, I just... The things we whine about were once the things we wished for. Everybody's got something to complain about. When Anna and I first got married, I worked at this really fun job. I'm not going to tell you the name of the company because I want to be honoring to them. But I got to unload really nasty trucks. I've talked about this a couple times. So if I repeat myself, I'm sorry. But it really brings home the point, I think. And so um, they would they like took terry towels like dish towels and uh, shop towels and uniforms and floor mats to different companies and organizations throughout the Fox Valley and all the way up into the UP that sort of thing and so they would get loaded onto this truck the clean product they would go and they'd bring it to the businesses they would take the dirty stuff put it on the truck bring it back and then that's where I got my job I got to unload it off the back of the truck throw it into these giant cages put it onto a semi got taken down to Milwaukee got cleaned got brought back up and then we would distribute it once again and the cycle would continue during the summer though Something really interesting happened. Um, You you take these restaurant towels and you take and you put them in a giant plastic bag and you put them outside in the sun with like by these dumpsters. (laughs) And so you would take them, these plastic bags, and I'd be unloading them off the truck and they would still be warm even though they've been sitting in a truck the whole day. And and then I'd pick them up, and I'd notice that there were these things like crawling inside of it. It was really nasty. There's maggots-filled bags, and every once in a while, they'd bust open. It was, it was not good. It was not good. And I eventually moved into a different job. I don't do that job anymore, believe it or not. And I moved into a different job, and I was over at my, my folks' place, Anna and I, and I think Jude was there at that point. Yes, he was. And we were over there. I think we were just having dinner talking about how I was shifting into this new job with a different company, a totally different thing. I was working in customer service up at Thrivent, up in Appleton. And my dad was, we were talking about like, my experience there. And he said, he said to me, you know, I never heard, once heard you complain about your work there. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. It was like just a side, it was just a passing comment. It wasn't even like, oh, hey, you did a really great job. It was just this passing comment. And I don't say this to be like, look at me, I'm the best. I don't complain or grumble about anything. You guys should be like me. No. Ask my wife, that's not the case. (laughs) The point is that people do notice that. People do notice when you don't grumble or complain or whine, especially when things are not good, especially when you've got a lot of things that you could be complaining about. Do everything, do all things without grumbling or disputing or quarreling or complaining. Turn your grumbling into gratitude. Because remember, most of the things that we whine about were the things that we once wished for. A lot of things that, that we complain about are things that we signed up for. You, you bought that house, and houses need maintenance. And so when the dishwasher goes out, like, well, yeah, it sucks, but you kind of signed up for this, you know? 
Like, you still have to mow the lawn. Like, you got married, and you have to learn how to live with this other person. And they do things a little differently than you. Like, you know that there's going to be some friction there. You signed up for this. We need to be grateful, thanking God, that he gave you the thing that you were so longing for, the thing that you were praying for, that you were working towards, that you were wishing for. It's amazing that how when we stop thanking God for the things that he's given us, that discontentment starts to creep in. That we start to, we get so nearsighted and on some level, on some crooked and twisted level, we start to think that we deserve it. We start to think that we earned those things, that we, by our own merit, by our own doing, that we have those things. We need to turn our grumbling into gratitude, especially with the things that we wished for, especially for the things that we were working towards when we finally have those things, continuing to be grateful for them. Oftentimes the things we are whining about are the things that we were wishing for. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes things just happen to you. Do all things without grumbling or complaining doesn't mean that you don't say that things suck. Because sometimes things just suck. And in this instance, the struggle actually is real. It's not ironic anymore. The pain and the hurt is real. This past week, there were shootings at a school in Texas. And this morning, there were moms and dads and brothers and sisters and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and friends that are waking up and once again have to face this realization that this person is gone. And they didn't choose that. They weren't wishing for that. They weren't searching for that. That happened to them. <coughs> Grumbling and complaining is different than saying, take this cup from me. Because Jesus, on the night that he was about to be taken away and be crucified, he prays. He's in this garden and he's praying to God and he says, God, would you take it away? I don't want to do this. He knows what's about to happen to him. He knows he's about to be tortured and crucified. And he's saying, God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get crucified. Would you take this cup from me? Asking God to take this situation away is not grumbling or complaining. Asking God to bring healing, that's not grumbling and complaining. It's acknowledging that there is something broken in the world and asking God to fix it. And in the midst of this, as he's sweating blood, as he's undergoing this tremendous amount of stress, he's able to muster up the words, not my will, but your will be done. Do all things without grumbling or complaining, Paul says from jail. Jesus says as he goes to the cross. Doesn't mean things are happy-go-lucky. Doesn't mean that there isn't real pain and real hurt that you have to work through. But there's a difference between saying, take this cup from me, and grumbling and complaining about it. I invite the worship team up. They're going to lead us in a few last songs here. And one of the things is we read passages like this. We come through, you're doing your morning devotions, and you read this passage, do all things without grumbling or disputing, quarreling, complaining. Like, on one level, it can just roll off your shoulders, be like, yeah, okay, I do that, it's totally fine, and then by the time you get into your car, you've totally forgotten about what you read that morning. On another level, you can be like, that's totally unrealistic. How, like, God is telling me to do this, but, like, does he know what he's asking? Does he know how much this world sucks? 
Does he know how much pain there is? Does he know how much, like, I just don't want to have to deal with this particular thing anymore? Even if it is the thing that I signed up for. And I think the thing that we forget is the therefore. At the beginning of this passage. Because this idea, working out your salvation with fear and trembling, doing all things without grumbling and complaining, connects back to this idea that Jesus was a humble servant. That he, Jesus, was in the form of God and he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But he took on the form of a servant. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. The one by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. That God that we worship became a servant. If anybody had the right to say, I'm it, I'm the best. It's him, and he didn't. He comes and he serves. We talked about last week, get over yourself. And again, get over yourself. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, doing all things without grumbling or complaining. And as you follow Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we don't get to grumble and complain. I'm just going to say it as plainly as I can. You don't get to do that. You don't get to do that because Jesus didn't do that and you are following Jesus. If you are grumbling and complaining, it is incongruent with the person and work of Jesus Christ. Don't grumble about your situation, but have gratitude in the midst of it. Pursue healing in the midst of it and have trust in the midst of it, knowing that Jesus will do what he said that he will do, that he will make all things new. And in the meantime, he calls us to carry our cross and follow him. To follow him as we carry this cross into our best life. As we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, we remember that he has led the way in this. And this is possible. Not only is it possible, but it's the call. It's who we're supposed to be as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the really simple ways that you call us to follow you. And thank you for giving us the strength and power to do it. Would you help us to take on the attitude of Christ who took on the form of a servant and was obedient and didn't grumble and didn't complain? Would we follow in his footsteps? God, would you heal the places that need to be healed in us? Would you make all things new? And in the meantime, as we have trouble, just like you promised, would we do it without grumbling and complaining that we would shine like stars in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation? Would we carry your banner well as we follow you? Jesus, you're so big and you're so mighty and you're so powerful. Thank you for coming to rescue us and bringing us into this best life that is free of grumbling and complaining. It's in your name we pray. Amen.